right, good evening and welcome everybody. Welcome to Holden Chapel. My name is Andrew Clark. I'm uh, currently Director of Choral Activities here at Harvard University and I'm joined by our guest of honor, my predecessor, Dr. Jameson Marvin, 32 years, Director of Choral Activities at Harvard and over five decades as a distinguished choral conductor, one of our country's most celebrated and important choral musicians. And uh, we're here to have a conversation with Jim to discuss his brand new book, um, Emotion in Choral Singing, Reading Between the Notes, uh, recently published by GIA Press, um, now available here tonight as well. So here at Holden Chapel, <clears throat> um, as we rehearse in here, as we work in here, we're surrounded by the giants on whose shoulders we stand. Portraits uh, just hung of um, F. John Adams, Jim's predecessor, of course, this beautiful relief of uh, Elliot Forbes, G. Wallace Woodworth um, next to him, and then high above us all, looking down sternly upon us, is Archibald T. Davison, who exactly 100 years ago, 1919, assumes officially the conductorship of the Harvard Glee Club and sets into motion what really has become the modern-day collegiate choral program, both at Harvard and in America. Before Doc's uh, work with the Glee Club, choral music was more of a pastime than a craft, more of an activity, really, than a serious practice. And Doc was able to preserve the communal spirit and the reality of the Glee Club while introducing them to the rich repertoire, particularly of uh, Western European tradition and folk traditions around the world, and in fact, um, I wanted to share share this with you here. Let's see if I can get this uh, technology going. Yeah, when Doc retired, he actually wrote a book. Uh, this is from 1940. He's still a faculty member um, at Harvard, but he wrote what really amounts to a, a pamphlet of. Um, his particular techniques and values, his methodologies as a choral conductor. And you can see here, there's a sort of a short prefatory note um, by Kuzovitsky with whom Doc worked. And so Jim is not only in, in, in this line of uh, leadership going back exactly 100 years, just like Doc um, codifying and, and preserving many of his um, thoughts uh, putting pen to paper and publishing this wonderful new book. Um, it was a joy to read this book. It really was. Um, and in reading it, just kind of um, vividly uh, remembering as someone who had a chance to sing with and, and work with Jim as an assistant conductor in the early 2000s to reflect upon that experience and to um, really just absolutely be uh, delighted by the enthusiasm with which um, you've written this book, the, the deep wisdom contained within, again, kind of bringing together um, with wisdom and enthusiasm your values, your methodologies, um, moments of the book that are both practical and aspirational. It is a book that is certainly accessible to the choral music aficionado or audience member as much as it is and should be a book for choral conducting courses and graduate students. Um, it's eloquent as well, it's beautifully written, and I think more than anything, um, it's authentically written. It, Jim's um, authenticity, his personality, uh, comes through in both this eloquence and enthusiasm and really his passion for, for choral music and for his life's work. So I think I might just start with some of the simple questions here around the genesis of the book. Why a book? Uh, how did it come about? When did you write it? And, and who was it for in, in your mind? Um, I, I realized it was actually 2018 was my 50th year of waving my arms. And I realized that I had learned a lot and I really wanted to, uh, while I was still able, uh, write it down in some coherent form. And, um, and I thought, why not write a book? I was thinking about it before I retired, which was 2010. Uh, gee, maybe I should write a book, but I certainly knew I wanted to continue 
conduct things. Well, I have with my community group, the Jameson Singers, and this is their ninth year, and this is my last year with them, actually, uh, because Polly and I would like to take a little vacation here and there. But I also do want to go out and do gigs at various universities, which I've had opportunities to do that. And what I thought of in writing the book was really for choral conductors of high school and college and community and church um, who are in practice, who are doing it now. Uh, because I've heard lots of choirs in the last, well, very long time that I felt technically they could be improved, but I also began to realize, especially in the last 15 years, the, the technical side is pretty darn good out there. Uh, I've been going to the American Choral Directors Association um, um, major um, gatherings every two years uh, since 1965, and so I've heard a lot of these choirs that come to ACDA. And when I first started, technically they weren't they weren't so hot, but they got better and better. And then as time has gone by, they've gotten very, very good. But I have to say, what I most miss is the connection with the music, a, sen a sense of empathy with the music, of sympathy with what is going on in this music, this sensibility of, of what I think of simply of an expression, um, and which what leads me to the idea of, you know, the notes are on the page, um, and uh, whole notes, half notes, quarter note, eighth notes. But what goes on between these notes? What is happening? Well, these are, this is just a graph. You can look at the graph, and you see the harmony, melody, and rhythm, and texture, but it may not tell you much about how the music goes. I often think, <laughs> excuse me for saying this, in hearing many conductors, I don't think they really know how the music goes. This is being recorded, I guess. And, uh, but I, um, and I mean that in the sense of, 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 well, a lot to do with the words, the word music relationships. And I know they, they consider the word as important. And of course, I've often said, it's too bad that choral music has words, because you can get a lot more done without the words. Because having the words there just interferes with a heck of a lot. And it's very difficult, but I've managed over time to actually include the words. But I, I, uh, I, uh, I'm probably rambling here, Andy. But of course, I, uh, I start really studying the words and the music, and developing what I think, what I think is the composer's idea. I'm imagining. Of course, it is one's imagination that brings up ideas, but what the composer really meant by that space between the given chart, the, the, the space between the notes of the chart, what goes on. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about that when I was studying the score. But of course, analyzing the harmony, the melody, and the rhythm, and the texture, and then how that's going to, in that analysis, which I call the mental oral image, it's in my head once I've spent a long time with it, and take it to a choir. And then, how do I get the choir to develop uh, a similarity uh, of, of the mentor image? Or what I also tell them, um, your mind's ear, or it's my mind's ear, how I think it goes. And um, so I really wanted to get that kind of information out to conductors in the field, but more especially with uh, uh, students who are getting masters or DMA and choral music who are, going, who are going to go into the field. Because I think this would be very helpful for them, and hopefully for conductors that are in the field. Um, and um, and that, that's, that's really in that I've spent a long time thinking about how a piece of choral music ought to go. Again, it is my imagination. We don't hear from the composer normally. Uh, and uh, I mean, yes, this century we can. But um, so anyway, I think a lot about that. That's yeah. what led me to the book. Well, you can see, I, I put up here um, the table of contents. You can see how the book really runs the gamut 
Uh, it sort of starts here with uh, part one, Jim's uh, first section, emotion and symbols, um, going into both kind of the history of singing through the conductor's process, Jim started to speak about through choral literature and the selection of repertoire, and I'll just sort of show you here kind of the f uh, sense of the final part of <clears throat> the book, score study, performance practice, conducting technique, um, getting to part two, which Jim calls the core, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. Score study, preparing the ear, the mental oral images, Jim says, um, for rehearsing the chapter 11. And then chapter three puts, a, or part three, I should say, puts a lot of these ideas into practice with specific um, repertoire and specific um, topics, and, and a lot of these topics Jim has presented to our colleagues in the field at various conferences, ACDA, Chorus America, NCCO, and, um, and in other places as well. And it all comes back to this, which this sort of is the product of Jim's mind and how his mind works, and I want to sort of in invite you to guess which part of choral conducting is the most important to James and Marvin by looking at this um, it's a little bit hard to read. I'll try and blow it up here a little bit, but it's sequential, starting here with literature, through score study, through performance practice, through the mental oral image, through development of the ear, through practicing, conducting, coming back to rehearsing, to performance, communication, inspiration, rejuvenation, back to, re back to rehearsal, right? Languages, piano, voice, instrumental knowledge, these are sort of the process, the things that um, conductors need to know, need to um, refine in this lifelong um, endeavor of mastering this craft. And um, Jim sort of takes us step by step through um, through this process in the book, don't you? Yes. It, this, uh, this chart came from uh, a, an article I wrote called The Conductor's Process, and her, it was for essays in honor of Howard Swan, who was one of the great masters when I grew up in Southern California. Uh, actually, his, one of his many students, one of his students was the conductor of my high school choir in Glendale, California. Howard Swan came to rehearse us every once in a while. And, um, but um, he became well known throughout ACDA in all, uh, all states in, the, in this country for being someone who, first of all, valued good music, which I do, and, and I valued him in valuing that. And so I was asked by the editor of the book, Gordon Payne is his name, who was at uh, Cal State Fullerton, if I could uh, write. Uh, uh, and I did, and I, I just wanted to write it sort of a consciousness of what goes into the choral, what a, what, a, what a choir director needs to think about, which starts with the literature and all the way through that cycle. And, um, and I touched on it a minute ago, that's studying the score and developing the, the understanding the harmony, melody, rhythm, texture, uh, and also performance practices. And my particular interest, interest, interest as time went by was Renaissance and performance. And, um, and, and then it began to widen, of course, and I, as an undergraduate at UC Santa Barbara, sang that some group called the Santa Barbara Chamber Singers. And the woman there, the, oddly enough, was the uh, conductor, and she was the was a voice teacher at Santa Barbara. She was an opera teacher. Well, you don't think of Renaissance music and opera teachers exactly <laughs> in the same breath, exactly. And but I just fell in love with this sound of Renaissance music. It's neither here nor there. It's it, it, it and it's also the timing isn't here or there. Each part is separate. So polyphony and modes at the same time, I began to realize, once I began to study it, I realized that's what I most love. And um, my, my voice teacher at Santa Barbara, who had gone to Stanford, said, Jim, you should go, and, go to Stanford and study with George Houle, who was then a person who studied with Putnam Aldridge, who had started the early music 
program at Stanford. Now, my parents, 65, and he was the best teacher I ever had, most inspiring. And I took, took Renaissance, Baroque, and, and classical music performance practices with him. And, um, and uh, Harold Schmidt was the conductor of the University Choir there, the Memorial Church Choir, and I was the assistant conductor of the Memorial Church Choir. So these people come back, came from Harvard, which is, I, I think, marvelous. But in the long run, I decided to transfer to a new program at the University of Illinois. And George Hunter was the early music person there, and Harold Decker, who became a very important mentor for me, who did music, which I needed. Music, not just Renaissance broken classic music, though, though uh, um, Harold Schmidt certainly did do that at Stanford, uh, but a, a great deal of other music. So that was very broadening and very widening for me, and that was very important for me. I think I've gotten off the subject. But Renaissance music is what started it all from, from Santa Barbara, and then because it was me, you know, Renaissance music has this quality. It still has exactly this mesmerizing quality. And all the singers that have ever sung with me, with the Glee Club or the Collective or the Choral Society, or now the Jameson Singers, I think their favorite genre is Renaissance. And folk songs. Folk songs often have the same kind of endearing quality. Uh, that sense of, um, uh, you see in folk song, it's also very, I can't think of the words, very sweet and very, um, kind of goes back in history with the text. And it's, um, it, 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 it creates a mood that I associate very much with Renaissance style performance. It's a, a similar affect, that's the word I was thinking of. And so with the three groups in our I did lots of folk songs, because I, I, I love them. But we did, I, I have to admit, and I importantly admit, that the Harvard Glee Club and Radcliffe Choral Society and the Collegiate Museum did an equal amount of Renaissance, well, for the men, the Renaissance into Monteverdi, not, not very far into Baroque, other than combined, of course. <laughs> but also uh, a lots of 19th, 20th, and then we began like, the fair amount of 21st centuries. And thanks to, to Bernie, actually, we, we had a lot of people writing for us that we, uh, but uh, with the Collegium, of course, it was all styles, because they could do uh, uh, things with orchestra. And, uh, and I have been very lucky, I'm going on and on, are you okay with this? I, yeah. I have other questions. Uh, I was at Illinois for two years, and I was the youngest head they had asked to come. And um, and and my and Harold Decker said to me, you know, you really ought to go out and get some experience before you really take a job. So I did. In that particular year, at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which was a men's course, uh, the, the man that was uh, there, Bob Cutler, very another mentor for me was going to go on leave the following year, and he had written to Harold Decker. I mean, yeah, Harold Decker, mm -hmm. uh, do you know someone? And because I saw him in the Glee Club as an undergraduate, along with the Collegium Musicum at, at, um, at UC Santa Barbara, I had had a lot of singing experience with the Glee Club, therefore I got, had a lot of repertoire that I knew. So I went, and it was a fantastic Glee Club. It was a wonderful Glee Club. And I was there, it was just one year, and that year, among many women's choirs, as was the tradition, uh, still is to some degree, I guess, we sang with Vassar College. And the man at Vassar College liked my work with the Glee Club, so he was going to go on leave the following year, so he asked me to come to Vassar, and I said, I thought, I assumed I would go back to California. Well, I would have wanted to be on the East Coast when I could go to California, and of course, that's where I really wanted to be, where you had reasonable climate, and you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, I um, did, uh, I did uh, decide, yes, I'll stay and do that, and I taught a bassin for nine years, and that, that background of women's choir music, along with my undergraduate, Club. I was actually there for 
five years because I didn't major in music till my sophomore year, and uh, and then the Lehigh Community Club, and then at Vassar I did a lot of a lot of uh, works because we combined the men's mm -hmm. courses there a lot of major work, mm -hmm. and that's luckily look, that background is what I think Harvard was looking for mm -hmm. in, in dossier, yeah, and so that that's how I got. To yeah, I mean, one of the things, just kind of with, with the process, and um, yeah, I think when I first met Jim, one of the first things that really kind of blew me away, um, just just respected his uh, tenacious, tenacious energy in rehearsal, his interaction with the students, and, you know, that was inspiring to me. But now, having actually done this job for nine years, I don't respect that energy. I'm completely dumbfounded by it. Um, <laughs> Just the, the limitless resources of every single rehearsal bringing um, just passion and pedagogical integrity, artistic imagination, and just trying to set the students' souls on fire through this work that we're doing. And um, I've often asked myself, just like, wow, where was that? Where did Jim find those resources? And um, certainly it does come from the students, even on the Days you might be feeling a little tired, and you're in front of these students, and then you know immediately you really feel energized. But it's interesting. I, I want to read a few very brief um, quotes from the book that speak to this, related to the process and related to inspiration. Um, these are just um, a few sentences that popped out that are very similar. As he's describing this chart behind me, Jim writes this on page 44: the complete process by nature is self-perpetuating and nourishes communication, inspiration, and rejuvenation. That's number nine up here. The lifeblood of the profound interaction between humanity and music. And then on page 77, he says this. The deeper the insights into the score, the clearer the mental oral image becomes. Clarity of insight inspires conductors to attain their vision. Inspired conductors motivate singers. Motivated singers inspire each other and the conductor. The process is self-renewing. Two more very quick quotes here along the same lines. It is important to point out that all of the principles upon which effective rehearsals are based require two essential ingredients, energy and desire. The energy the conductor gives is the primary motivator that stimulates singers to achieve the conductor's ideals. And then finally, on here, page 137, there is little doubt, there can be little doubt about music's profound capacity to rejuvenate spirits. So this idea of self-perpetuating energy and nourishment and rejuvenation runs through this book, runs through your work, and um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit um, to that. One of the things, you know, that none of us in the room ever was, were, was really able to see is Jim Marvin in solitude with a score, studying a score. Maybe talk a little bit about where did you do that? Did you have a particular time of the day when you would sit down? Was it typically at home? Were you sort of kind of cramming in a rehearsal plan on your commute to Cambridge from Lexington? <laughs> like, where did that, the sort of beginning of this um, sort of self-perpetuating, nourishing energy that I think in the book what comes through is that it really does begin with a selection of literature and score study. So I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about how you studied scores and where, and what was that like for you? Thank you. Thank you for asking these good questions. Uh, and um, by nature, I'm enthusiastic. And I remember my dad saying to me one day when I was pretty young, walking our dog, I love dogs, uh, Jim, don't ever lose your enthusiasm. He said it very urgently, and I thought to myself, well, would I? I mean, it was a, it was a scary thought. And, uh, so, but I don't think I have. And I must say, in most rehearsals, I am pretty enthusiastic. Sometimes more so than others. But I, I think what really happens to me is very natural for me, and I think for a lot of conductors and people who study in depth. I, I sit at home on my piano. 
with my great digital process, which is quite profound. And, uh, and uh, now when I was younger, I didn't play pretty well, but I, yes, I pick scores. Well, first of all, I pick out a lot of scores I'm thinking I want to do, but I'll go through those scores. Same for the men, the women, and the mix, because I had the great joy of, of doing all three. Um, and then if I'm just sticking, it's almost nearly in the glee club along here, so sticking with the men's music, I would play through a lot of stuff. And, and my, I might like it, but I might say, I don't think the glee club's going to like this piece. Uh, I could be wrong, but over time I could judge pretty well. And then, or I'll, I'll say to myself, you know, this is really a good piece. Uh, I, I'm not sure they're going to like it, but I think I can sell it. And because um, and a lot of pieces I did choose that were, were like that, and, and it did work. It took a little time in rehearsals, of course. But, um, but what made me stay with pieces mostly was the sense that I really developed a sense of, I can't wait to do this piece. I just can't wait. I just cannot wait. I mean, that's just the way I feel, the way I am right now. Right now, I'm on the kind of fire. I get in rehearsals. I'm just like this in rehearsals. You got that on that screen over there? Anyway, and, uh, no, I am just that way in rehearsals. Even the Jameson singers in my 77-year-old daughter, I, I think I do that a lot. And I get, I'm excited to tell you about this, because it's a good book. Anyway, uh, but I really, I am by nature this, I get, I get excited by what I read, by, by the scores I'm reading, and I can't wait. It's the teaching that, that is everything for me. I want to teach this. I want these kids, they're just kids, I want them to learn about this piece, and I can't wait. So I usually come to rehearsals with that in my head. Now, of course, over time, I've narrowed down things to what I most want to do, and that relate, relates to programming, which is, which is, I'm happy to talk about that, that but, but to come to rehearsals, and so for a given <clears throat> Monday night was when the glee club rehearsed. Are you still, for Monday night, I don't remember. I've forgotten things like that, of course. <laughs> and, I would spend, or for one afternoon, I, I would spend time at home for that very rehearsal. Remembering what I'd done uh, last Thursday or Wednesday, whenever it was, or well, whenever it was Thursday. But they had a good enough ear, they could bring it into their ears to begin to do it. And I often would take slowish people, because uh, I thought they could do it. And I rarely, I don't think I ever made a mistake, actually, in that way. But so. I will then, I will hear the group, first rehearsal, and I thought to myself, they don't have a clue how to sing in tune. And uh, so, how do you do that? And, and I love to do that. And, you know, one of my, just, I have so many techniques to teach integration. But, you know, if it's, if it's really clearly in tune, with, it's being in tune with the overtone series. It's, that's the bottom line where the octaves actually match on the same vowel, that little tricky. Or the fifth, they're so slightly higher than the piano. Or the major third, definitely low to the piano, considerably low. And I love, and then we listen to overtones in, in the rehearsals, and they begin to hear them. And then as we learn a piece of music quite well, we stop, do you mind my talking about this? Stop at uh, a case that, I mean, it just stops. And, uh, and we'll, we'll stop and we'll hold it. And, and then I'll, I'll say, this is after a lot of practice, it's not in tune, fix it. So I do it again, and they fix it. So I teach them to teach themselves. Yeah, I, that's, that's actually a great segue. That was one thing I wanted to, I want to read a, a section of the book exactly about that. So they, the underlying philosophy answering the question, how do I get my choir to sing in tune? I'm sure your career, you're going to conferences, bringing these groups on tour, teachers, conductors will come up to you, I'll come up to you and say, how do I get my choir to sing in tune? And your answer is this, that the conductor must teach singers how to teach themselves to sing in tune. And then there's another section here I want to read um, related to this. Um, Make clear, singers are expected to mark their parts during these 
learning stages, during the sort of technical stage of, of learning the piece. They, the singer, soon realize that being part of an ensemble is a privilege that requires responsibilities. When singers feel responsible for marking their individual part, they are empowered with the ability and knowledge to effectively improve and maintain change, the core of the rehearsal process. And we've had a lot of conversations recently with the students and just sort of unpacking this question, what does it mean to be empowered? Well, certainly on the side of the administration and leadership and management, students are empowered, they're learning leadership skills, they're working together. But how does that work in a choral ensemble? And, and I think what I appreciated remembering and reading the book is is facilitating an experience with the singers to provide them the skills and understanding to be independent from the moment they arrive by rehearsal two or three, you're singing in mixed uh, quartets, requiring students to, to work toward an independence, right? And to get to the point where you can arrive at a cadence and say, tune it, and they do. And, um, you know, in English, the word conductor really actually means to lead with. It's not necessarily supposed to be this kind of top-down um, fascist dictatorship, but rather one in which you're e equipping and empowering um, you know, these artists. I, I say to the students that sometimes our goal is our obsolescence. Um, I don't really mean that, but I think we're trying to try, try, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but getting, getting the group to the point where um, you know, they are really taking responsibility and, and thinking of that as Empowerment. I think it's a good reminder in the book. I also want to touch upon, you, you, you um, mentioned repertoire, and I do have a couple um, questions about repertoire before opening it up to folks for um, their questions and queries. Um, you talk about putting together a concert program, oh. and um, you write here that my trademark is to program uninterrupted sets of pieces, often three. I believe applause after each piece interrupts the singer's mood. A continuous exchange of energy between the choir and audience creates a confluence of evolving emotions. And what's very interesting, I think, what my colleague Nathan Reef and others would um, would attest to is that this has actually become normalized in the in the choral field. It's something you've been doing for decades. Go to choral performances now, and you'll hear uh, uh, sort of a pastiche or a, a series of works curated in a way to perform as one long form narrative of uninterrupted uh, music making and taking the audience, as you say, on a journey. But then you follow that up with uh, something I thought was interesting, with, which I think uh, might be a difference between you and I. And I wanted to ask you this, not in any sort of confrontational way. I'm generally interested. But it's just sort of normally I do not program according to intellectual themes. And I think that, you know, I, I really appreciated that as a singer here, that there wasn't like we're going to sing, you know, a concert about war is bad and peace is good, you know, like you, you weren't thinking about themes. And, but yet sometimes the six, eight pieces or 12, we, sometimes there would be themes emerge. Sometimes things would percolate to the surface, or you would certainly feel like you were part of a kind of long form dramatic and narrative trajectory. Yes. But I guess, um, you know, if, if you weren't thinking about themes and you wanted to put together, let's say, a 25 minute set for the first Prince football concert, what were you thinking about? Were you thinking about um, the diversity of the repertoire? Were you thinking about the pieces that the group could learn that fast and sing well and have courage taking stage and pride leaving the stage? And how were the pieces cured? Well, yeah, well, yes, in that sense, I'm not thinking about the way I describe programming. It was more, uh, somewhat had to do with diversity, but certainly had to do with starting in a particular mood, I mean mood, emotionally oriented, uh, in a particular mood, and that would then lead to something that didn't destroy that mood. That was not, you know, happy, happy, hoopy, that I, I can't stand that to do, as a contrast. I think, I think that just alien to me, it alienates me when I do that. But anyway, I, I don't want it to continue. And so, yes, it might be more up, but in, in, it's kind of a double answer I'm trying to give in that in, to, in, in choosing tour repertoire, you know, an hour and a half, say, of actual pieces, then I would group. Uh, and I, I want to take the audience along for an emotional ride. I want them to stay with it so they really get involved. And 
Uh, the way I found in doing that is that piece A to B, perhaps polyphonic renaissance, say, to uh, 20th century polyphony, very different harmony involved, perhaps slightly faster. And, and, and that, in other words, they're writing the mood of polyphony and modes into something that's purely sensitive and warm, but definitely polyphony, to another that would be perhaps more homophonic, but uh, in, in, a, in this stage of what, what I think of as very serious, but, but um, maybe more, more up in a, in a clearer way from Renaissance, to this, which may be more zippy in some ways. Bringing them along for the ride, and I, that's kind of crude ways of saying this, but that's, I do love to bring them along to, for the ride. And also, on tour with the Cleveland or the Clayton or the Coral Society, it does the same thing. They feel so wonderful after a set of three. Sometimes it's two of its two fairly long pieces. And then, and then the applause, you know. They, most, at least, in most places you go, you get good applause. And I think they really appreciate that. Um, yeah. um, the, so it's, a, it's kind of a double answer. Yeah. And, so, I, and I did want to say, in terms of talking about uh, tuning and saying, uh, and I just said right out a minute ago, tune it. Well, I, I don't do that until we've, we've, we've come to the end and we are on it, and I'll say X, Y, Z, uh, you know, it has to do with vowels and balance and the individual parts that need to match in terms of overtones and do A, B, C. And then maybe we come back to that. This is a piece they know well. Mm -hmm. that, that needs to be. <laughs> and then we could come back to that. And then I would say, so, you know, if it's just three minutes and I go there, I'll, then I can say, tune it. And you, you can hear. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give them a downbeat, and they're moving. And I'll ask them, did you hear that? Meaning, did you hear each other in a way moving? Did you hear that it was better than automatically? It isn't just by saying that. Yeah. They know it is better. And so that teaches them. And on tours, I would, I'll always do this, or in concerts, I still do this. Yeah. You know, happens all the time. You know, a big, a big part of... Um well, your remarks tonight in the book is um, one of sort of your life's sort of crusades is the, the advocacy for Renaissance polyphony, making the case. Um, and one of the, you know, this is a big, big part of, of the book um, in several spots. Um, is that was just a specific question for you? Because I've noticed for our students here, even over the last decade, um, their ability to sing a homophonic work with complex homophonic harmonies, cluster chords, etc., they're masters at it. But with each passing year, singing in polyphony and counterpoint is becoming more and more of a foreign language. Even with the audition piece, which is a same piece that you used for the preliminary auditions, a work of Renaissance polyphony, um, students are, are, are singing this style, in some cases, for the very first time. So my, my my direct question to you is: Do you have a theory as to why? Why have oh why have folks sort of g gone away from yeah uh, polyphony or composing polyphony? I mean, do you have any theories as to why? Yes, this? you know, I don't know how accurate they are exactly, but the <clears throat> accumulation is clear now. Choirs in high school and colleges they basically don't sing polyphony, no matter what. Well, if they did a Renaissance piece, but they don't do Renaissance music. And um, the, I think what it is, is with the advent of uh, a CD with uh, uh, excellent singers of, we'll say, 16 singers that are professionals uh, and are counted as, I can't think of the word, it's what I make fun of, uh, uh, when it's touted, when you hear a CD and they say, this is what an example of, you know, really perfection of the Renaissance. It's it, it's historically it's, informed, or it's, well, it's along that line. Yeah, they're special. It's, yeah, informed. Yeah, informed. Yeah. Yes, this is informed music making, and this is informed, which which raises my shackles because informed in what way? I know what they're saying. Meaning informed style. 
Well, uh, yes. Uh, I don't hear it that way necessarily, but I know what they mean, and it's often very, very good, very high level. Um, and I think once that really started, especially that phrase, form style has been going on in CD production, I would say maybe 40 years. I don't know. That's a guess. Somewhere around that. Certainly in 1965, uh, going to Illinois, I never heard that phrase. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long ago that was, but it was long ago. It's, it's, it's ironic because the early music movement emerges as a, as a liberation, and now they become the oppressors. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> no, I think, because they're, they're wanting everybody to, but you know, what it, what it does, what I'm really trying to get at, is of course, if you have a dream choir in your college who's really excellent, you can really emulate that in the form style in many, many ways. But if you have a choir, as we do here, 60 kids in the choirs, well, it's hard to do that with the big choirs. And Renaissance music with the big choirs, a big challenge. And quartets helped a lot. And they also, quartet singing teaches them independence, teaches them musicianship, and um, teaches them to be, um, uh, yes, independent is another good word that goes with independence. Uh, but the, the, um, I got off the subject, the idea of being informed with, with a big choir is very hard to do from the point of view of listening to a CD and they're small groups and they're very, very good. And they're, the answer always, I can't ever get my choir to sound like that. Well, my answer is, yes, you can. And I, I know how to tell you to do that. Now, if this is a choir full of, ah, ah, ah I would say, you know, they, it's not going to work with endless floppy vibrato, it just won't work. But most choirs don't have that big of a vibrato, and especially in high school. College, depends where you go. But you certainly can. And one of my, yes, just do that. Yes. Just look at them do that. And some of my, uh, my uh, excitement <clears throat> to do, because this is my last concert with the Jameson Singers, Brahms Record. By the way, we have 87, I think it is, singing. Huge. We've never had more than 65 or so, I think. And I think it's because it's my last year. And also the Brahms Record, so many alumni are coming back that live in this area. It's so efficient. That's fantastic. We can't, we're really looking forward to it. I really am. I wonder what I got. No, it's okay. I, 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 I wanted to just sort of pass uh, the mic over to our, um, to our audience, anyone who has any um, questions for Jim about his career, about this particular book, any questions about the topics that have uh, emerged so far this evening. Dr. Krieger. I'm curious as to whether, where do you think you should, one should go with tailoring a concert by one of, let's say, these three groups? to a specific audience. Oh. You, you were just talking about arranging the program and you know, getting your resources together to send it. But where does the audience come in, let's say on a spring tour or a summer tour, do you set a program for an audience mm -hmm. or do you really go at it from the point of view is this is the product as well as we can present it. And we're glad you bought tickets to this thing. Now sit back and enjoy it. <laughs> well, is there a balance? Uh, yeah, I think there should be. Uh, I, think, I think at some level, uh, an audience that's not at all sophisticated, but hearing a beautiful sound from the choir, they're taken in by the sound to begin with. But the actual literature over time that you see, I think it needs to include their, you know, I, I often on tours with the Blue Club would be told, well, you know, this is not going to be an audience that's going to be very sophisticated. And so, as you know, it was just spontaneous on the tour. Because the, the tour repertoire is, you know, maybe two hours of repertoire. I mean, just two an hour and a half, plus the intermission, plus people, students introducing him. Uh, and so I would then choose maybe some more folks on them. And or some simply pieces. Yeah, I would try to do that. I think it's important, and especially because it's Harvard. You know, I didn't grow up in Harvard, and that that idea of Harvard, where you go, you know, I, I you know me, I, I'm not a Harvard type. If I could say, I'm not that at all. Did you know that? And, and uh, 
it's not. I'm, I'm probably offending everybody here, but uh, whatever you you might think that is, I'm just not a long haul type person. Uh, and Polly's mother was a very long doll and was a fantastic woman. But anyway, so I, I don't want to go and intimidate anybody. I am not. I don't like being intimidated, and I certainly don't like intimidating intimidating anybody. I don't like that at all. And so I try to do both in answer to your question, if that's helpful. Yes, Christian. Um, I'm curious um, if you think uh, about um, legacy, um, uh, which having worked, and maybe I'm mischaracterizing this, but you you helped amateurs more than professionals. Hmm. And do you have any regrets about not having spent more of your life working professionals since this, since this is your your art? Right. No, I. That's what I love about them. They are amateurs. I love working with, especially at Harvard, because they're so quick, and they may not have much experience singing. But I always talk about this community of kindred spirits because it, it is a community. We're all trying to do. We're trying to perfect something to get it good. First of all, we feel good <laughs> when it sounds good. But of course, we imagine that we're going to take it on tour, we're going to do a concert in Sanders, and we want it to be good, because we want the audience to really feel it. And there's another community of kindred spirit, that audience. So I don't really, no, I never thought about conducting professional music. I don't think, I, that hasn't occurred to me. Uh, of course, we, we do have professional orchestras that we normally sing with. Sometimes HRO, that was great. I really enjoyed that and enjoyed us. And, uh, but, no, um, the Bronx Red Wing is going to be a really, really fine orchestra. And many, many big orchestras. Of course, before I came and with back to Doc's and Woody's age, and to some degree with that, Sean, his choirs, combined choirs, did perform with the, with the Boston the Orchestra which was fantastic, and I knew all about it when I came here and I asked about it. And it had been two or three years since that had happened, so that, that just didn't happen. And, um, and, you know, that was exciting for me to think about that. Um, it did apply, it did occur to me when the Tanglewood Festival Chorus conductor <coughs> retired, he was pretty ill by then, because uh, I heard Tango Festival Chorus. Are any here singing in the Tango Festival Chorus? Go ahead and sing. So you're on the live stream anyway. You're in trouble, right? <laughs> I'm in trouble already. And, but, you know, I mean, you know, that's a grotesque sound. And uh, it's not a chorus. It's just a bunch of singers. That they like to sing. Excuse me. For, I should. I mean, I. Polly would tell me never to say something like that. And I obey Polly almost all the time. But anyway, yeah, I had thought of applying for that job. I never did, but it did occur to me. The guy they have now is excellent. Mm -hmm. He was given a very bad write-up in the Globe, but it turns out not to be true is what, what has happened. He's really, really good. Mm -hmm. and, and I love working with professional orchestras. I mean, we get some of the very best, and some of the very best of art we got. Combine choirs uh, mm -hmm. uh, stuff, uh, or or seeing that compassion and clicking, or mm -hmm. or or whatever, and that was a great choice. Mm -hmm. And that's entirely different. Uh, yeah, that's right. Is a follow-on to the is a follow-on to the previous question. I think one of the things that surprises people when they hear the. Part of choirs is that there are in fact there's no kind of conservatory or uh, music performance program yeah. at, at Harvard. How did that shape both the way that you approached uh, conducting choirs as well as kind of influencing the overall experience and product that you were able to create mm -hmm. by, by not having you know, students and voice in the choir in the same way that you might at other yeah. universities? Well, I before I came, of course the Nine years have passed, they're all just young students who like to sing. It's exactly my fear, and they just wanted to be there. And at Lehigh University, same thing, the engineering school. 
And then in graduate school, I sang the graduates that are all amateurs at uh, UC Santa Barbara and also the Chamber Singers. And, uh, and at, at um, Stanford uh, also and Illinois. Uh, the top of the choirs were not professional, they were just good singers. But I never, I really never thought about it when I came. I just wanted to conduct, not so much, yes, it was a tremendous honor to go to Harvard. I mean, I thought, Glendale, California, Harvard? I mean, I'm just, I'm not oriented that way. But anyway, I, I began to realize, first of all, I heard, the, I heard all three groups when they, when I, as in the audition. And the Glee Club was very good. The, and, um, and they, they seemed like me, this time went by, I don't know, but anyway, uh, but they were very, they were very good. Um, RCS had lost a lot of women, um, and was the, because the collegium was kind of taking over that, that idea of women and men, and, um, and the, uh, the collegium was new, and they were good, but it wasn't the level of the club. RCS was small, I think it was about 40 in it when I heard them. And one of my missions was to pick an associate conductor, which was turned out to be Beverly Taylor. There were several auditionees, and she was by far the, the best. But I mean, not, I mean, conducting doesn't so much matter to me. It's more more her way with the choir and interacting, and that was very important and also funny and smart and very gifted with languages. She's very good with languages, and so anyway, so I did the Glee Club and the Collegium. And, um, and I knew how to get the clean club better, but they resisted for a while. But then uh, by the, my third year, I think they came along pretty well. And, uh, and thank you for nodding. And, uh, and so uh, then, um, then, but the collegium, I, I knew right away what to do. And I love to work with students to get them better. Because they, you know, it's nothing like getting them better and having them realize to themselves, oh, I'm better. And I couldn't do that. That pleases them, and that's a, that's that sensibility. It, it's that that can't the word you use. Yeah, that. Rejuvenation, rejuvenation, yes, yeah, inspiration, yeah. rejuvenation, back and forth, back and forth, always. And I mean, there were times when I'd come to her song, groups were kind of blah. The play didn't like to talk. <laughs> well, the Glee Club did talk, but they were kind of funny. <laughs> and I had fun. And of course, Noah was the great comics. Well, so was Dr. Bernard. And, uh, but, um, <laughs> and, uh, I get excited. Well, I know, I did say his question to the question. It's a great question. I mean, I think we forget sometimes that our colleagues at other universities are working with singers in their choirs who don't necessarily want to be there. They're required to be there. So if, if you were at a music school, if you were at an institution with a large um, group of voice majors for whom part of their curriculum was a requirement to sing in choir, nobody is coming to the choruses here other than because they want to be there. I, I, I love that. Yeah, me too. I wouldn't trade that for anything. And the, the sense that there was a choral, I mean, voice program when I came, I think it was a couple of people, and then I enlarged it to some degree, and then you more I mean, it's thriving, yeah. And really, at a loss, it's hard to get this. Very grateful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The other questions? Oh, yeah, your hand is in yeah. Logan, yeah. Uh, so, Jim, one of the things uh, I always found most inspirational about working with you was, uh, and I actually think that image you had of both rehearsal in the middle, the notion of process, and something I've always found very inspiring is that it seems to me, at least, that the process of rehearsing is what really drives me more than the end of the concert, almost so much so that, oh, yeah. you know, I wondered how much the concert itself really matters to you versus each individual person. Yeah, I, I, and I, I just would say, in the context of Harvard, you know, people are so dense focused. Where am I going? What am I going? You know, that was a really valuable lesson, and I think I'm curious your thoughts on that. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I was completely aware that the students were really thinking about that concert down there. Well, I was too. I basically wanted them to sound good. <laughs> but certainly, we cannot sound good down there unless we can, on a given rehearsal, sound fantastic. And um, that magic moment. 
that usually occurs without the text, of course. Staccato do, and then legato do. Legato do. Staccato, legato, back and forth. That's everything. That is that state. That's the, the heart of the rehearsal techniques I do use. And I mean, the words get in the way because of all these different vowels, let alone consonants. And, um, but I, I think the students and I just would live for those magic moments. I, I think they went away feeling up, and I did too. And there were some rehearsals, neither one of us would go away feeling up. I had to. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, <laughs> but this, uh, this really was, you know, and it became clear that it's the process that, that really is more important. Mm -hmm. It is the concept that is what we're aiming at and, and the goal. But in, in the long term, I mentioned that in the book, it's, in a way it's the process that for me is the goal. And each, each one is better. It's nice to think, and I, I certainly fully aware of it. Students really wanted that concept to be really good. But by the time they got on stage, they were pretty confident. They had to be confident. And to make it good, you can't be good unless you're confident. And, uh, and then, you know, they were confident. You know, yeah, okay. Good question. Um, so, Jim, I was, I was struck by the title, by your choice of the title for this book. I, I, I could easily imagine you writing a book called Protection in Choral Singing or Mastery in Choral Singing, but you chose to start with the word emotion in choral singing. And I wonder, I, I wonder what led you to decide to lead with emotion rather than something else. Maybe it's writing the book, but. Uh, well, can I just quote one, one really <laughs> quick thing here? Because I was on what that was on my list this idea that just so he, Jim Law writes a lot about the emotional consciousness. Yeah. And uh, when we hear music, we experience moments of tension and release, anticipation and resolution, growth and decay, sound and silence. That's a little bit of, I think, getting to this idea of what's in between the notes, yeah. These qualities create moods that signal change, amplifying, complementing, and enhancing emotional consciousness through the diverse communicative mediums of pitch, duration, timbre, and intensity is music's inherent gift. But I was curious too as to how the, the title of the book came about. Well, I think it's because of my recent rhythms, but the making of the music has to do with what, how they sing that. And I think it has to do with generally, at least me, trying to point out that you know, <clears throat> the, as I was saying in rehearsals, the composer didn't have to do that. And, why did he do that? And, you know, it's like a distance right there, a minor second. There's nothing more beautiful than a minor second or a major seven. Those are most beautiful intervals, but they have to be wide enough. They're not the piano. I mean, that's a grotesque sound. Well, all pianos are grotesque for that matter. But anyway, excuse me, I'm sorry to put that. The minor, minor seconds have to be wide enough. The major seven have to be narrow enough to really and to spend some time in rehearsal, and I do it with James and Singers now, and I know I did it with the Glee Club and Collegium, of course, like, holding a note, and, and somebody who's going to go to a, well, let's say it's a minor second above it, I'll just hold a note, the panels come down, and it's not wide enough. But when it is wide enough, you hear this flutter of overtones all over the place. Not, not that, that the flutter of all overtones is uh, all that um, expressive, uh, uh, yes, at a certain level, it certainly is, but it's not like the audience is going to hear that. But what's expressive is the, is the reason behind the minor second, and that is the word. And the, it's so it's intervallic relationships, what I try to get at more than anything. anything. In the book, I talk about, you know, chords that have a, a, the base, the bass is the base of the root of the chord, or the third of the chord, you know, E, uh, C, G, C, C. And uh, that has a wanting to, to move because that so called leading tone is down there. And then, but, or a 6 4 chord with the G and uh, a G and then um, E, G, C, or whatever, but the G is quite unstable. And, uns and, and in that sense, it's ongoing. It's, it's that, that sense of 
foreverness. I can't think of the word. It's the sense I gave. I give for Renaissance music. It it continues. There's a life after after that, and I think that's very much what's in mind with the composer when you when you do a six four chord because it's very different than a root chord. Or third. Um, and then it's the, the note that's in the soprano. The C kind of closes. In. That's it. Finale. That is it. Or the third. Well, that kind of rings. It, it's a, I assume that something is about to follow. That is the kind of feeling. On the other hand, in the fifth, there's a kind of finality that isn't really finished. It's kind of an ongoing sensibility. The Schütz, Zerich Sinti Toten, ends on that fifth, and I think for that very reason. I think earlier composers were much more conscious of absolute intervals in that sense. And then what, what goes between them? Well, also, you know, it's just the simplistic thing as the, as the, <clears throat> as your part gets higher, it probably would get louder. That would be kind of a natural thing to happen. And unless you're very much concerned with a particular balance problem here and there, but the normal, and then, or descending, it would get softer. Of course, if it descends, it also flats. So you've got a nut, got, got a nut flat as you descend. And it's going to be automatic when you descend. And uh, so, <laughs> getting into two periods of it. And, uh, but that's part of it. And going to concerts and hearing the belongings, and they may be very, very good. Really, I mean, they're very, very good. I mean, technical stuff, not easy that they were doing. But it doesn't grab me. It doesn't lift me up. Hmm. And if somebody's really good technically, and express it. That lifts me up. You know, that always does it. So that's for cool. Is that helpful? Yeah. We had a guest conductor working at the Glee Club a bit <clears throat> earlier in the spring who posed the question you know, are we singing to impress or are we singing to inspire? Hmm. And of course, you can do both. It's not a binary, right? <laughs> but if it's just to impress, no, at, at the end of the day, no. yeah, it's a self-actualizing exercise. It's not music making. It doesn't. Yeah, I don't. I, I, I never think of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, other. Yes, sir. Could you talk about the origin of staccato view? Uh, <laughs> never before or since singing with you have I ever heard anybody else. It didn't, wasn't one of your students. Staccato or like you. That's. So Robert Fountain did that as well, didn't he? Did he? I don't know that. I'm glad to know that. He was one of the great college conductors. Uh, I think I got it from Shaw. I knew played for Shaw. And I, I sang the Shaw about four different times. And when I first started the Shaw, I heard him just to call you. And then he went to the number business, which, which you know, singing a uh, hell no on numbers, which Staccato do is much better. But I use, I mean, Chalk did Staccato do uh, for uh, ensemble rhythm, uh, keeping it together. And I use Staccato do, yes, and certainly you can hear when somebody's making a rhythmic mistake, uh, if everybody's just singing Staccato. But if it's, if it's, I think of it more as platooning. And um, uh, often, if it's too staccato, they can't match pitch. That, do, you know, but, I mean, I, I can't say anymore. You know, it, it's do, 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 not do, do, because it slides, it doesn't match. So I try to teach them what what to do for that staccato. And then, of course, once everything's staccato, go over it, they got it. It's so profoundly beautiful. And you hear every minor second, because I want to talk about that. The other benefit to so um, the late William Denning, who for a long time was the director of choral activities, University of South, Southern California, also wrote a great, really fun book. Um, Very funny book. Yeah, funny book. Yeah, he would say actually that one of the benefits of staccato do is that the singer themselves has to have the vocal apparatus ready to go because you have such a quick amount of time to be able to make the sound and shape the sound. You know, it just sort of was training the group to be prepared to, um, from a technical standpoint, have the right, the right shape, the right placement, but the way you put it, the right ear voice coordination. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Which is greatly affected by that. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a question, comment. Now, but first, the comment. Andy took the Greek Club down to Rhode Island a handful of years ago mm -hmm. to sing with some choruses that he had worked with before. Oh, yeah. And before the concert, what the Glee Club was singing along with the water manager student chorus was Talus Lamentations, oh. just for fun. <laughs> so I don't think that polyphony is dead. <laughs> but I'm curious as to what the both of you um, plan to do uh, to keep it alive and get more people interested, especially, I think, the groundwork should be laid with everybody interested in STEM. Lots of people are interested in programming, in, in, the, um, in the mathematics and the, and the geometry of that music. Yes. It should be a natural to enlist this cohort of folks coming up ready to do that. Mm -hmm. What's your proposal? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mathematical relationship of, of uh, well, tuning certainly, but of polyphony too. Yeah. yeah. Where are you in multi-dimensional space? <laughs> <laughs> Well, what I do realize is that, no, I don't think it's absolutely dead, but I, I do, I mean, I've been to conventions forever and ever, and I haven't heard of Ron's Motet at least 10 years. And I've been, you know, in all these choirs, there may be 25 choirs in one convention. And, I mean, Brahms, this is, of course, Brahms went into Schutz and Bach, you know, I just got back from a high school, conducting a high school festival in the spring break, yes, 100 and, about 160 kids, actually in my, in my hometown. Oh! It was really surreal. It was a regional all state in Pennsylvania at the high school where I graduated and the all state choir that I sang twice. So, it was, so I, I programmed Brahms, right? And I said, first rehearsal, okay, yeah. raise your hand if you've sung Brahms before, and maybe, maybe seven or eight of the 160. Oh. And they've sung, you know, the middle movement of Brahms directly and unlikely, right? Yeah. And um, I mean, we, it was, uh, it took a lot of work because it's just not, um, I mean, singing in driven was also a stretch for some folks, but um, again, it's in the book as well. The game changer was singing mixed. When, and, I, and I thought, and I thought intuitively, oh my God, no, they got the same sections; they need each other. They're not; they're dependent on one. But as soon as they sat and mixed, they hear better. They sit up straighter. Like, oh my God, I got to impress the soprano or this is sitting next to me. Oh, um, yeah, take ownership. Take ownership, and then, yes. and you know, in three days, got to the point of not the performance was respectful, but more importantly, it was enjoyment or just like a just sort of eye process. <laughs> the process, yeah. I think too, um, Jim's been doing a lot of great work around the country at uh, different meetings and master classes with <laughs> colleges, um, with future teachers. I think um, more and more of this music is starting to be, um, you know, pu published with really good editions. I mean, you know, you've yeah. like jumped on a lot of that, but. And I don't know the answer, Brian. I, don't, I, I don't know how um, and it, it, to make the case, really. It leads into composers. Composers mm -hmm. don't, don't compose polyphony. Well, a few do, but very few. It's all based on the sound. It's such cool sound. Add a major six to the other chord. <laughs> 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 no, it's just cool since James Waldo. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> but, you know, it does. It's, it started with intimidation, mm -hmm. with, you know, we can't get our choir to sound that good, to then, therefore, um, publishers don't want to publish something that's polyphony if, they're not, if they think they're not going to be able to do it. But, but what I should have started with then, composers leads to publishers, leads to, you know, and it's been a cycle for, well, at least 35 years. I'm quite aware of that. I think one of the cases you make that we certainly see here for sure is that, um, I mean, you've already mentioned a lot of really great reasons, but, you know, for me, especially in the beginning of the year, there is, Dale Warland will say this, like, there is no greater didactic tool than your repertoire to build a choir, to build skills, and just 
you know, it's like it's the analog to a Hannon exercise for a pianist to sing. But when Bach, Christoph Wolf would say that actually Bach wrote the motets, yes, for specific funerals and occasions, but Bach would use the motets in training the choir boys of the Tomashula yeah. in not only how to conquer or how to, um, um, you know, develop into a virtuosic choral musician, but the motets were used to train not only music, but rhetoric and theology. So the music itself becomes um, yes. um, development musicianship. the development. And so, you know, if a, if a singer is singing their quartet audition and, you know, Still, we, we still have, even in the both preliminary and quartet auditions, they're polyphonic works. And um, yeah, that first month of the year, you really see, I think in many ways, the greatest growth because, you know, if you're introducing, which is something we stole from your playbook, and also, I mean, look, the, 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 the rich love of polyphony goes back even before you and I. I mean, and, and if you look at the, the additions that Doc was making, the music he was advocating for, and Doc was on a, on a mission, too, to try and improve the state of music education, K through 12, up to collegiate music across the board. Um, I think it's a big part of the culture here, always has been. Oh, well, well it was. I mean, I read from the conductors in the past, yes, absolutely. No, I don't sense, I'm sure, well, of course, I know, if John loved Renaissance music, and that was lucky for me, because I love Renaissance music, so it was, a, it was a relatively easy fit in that way. And uh, But no, it would be a lot of polyphony in those days, and I'm sure you guys were singing. Did Woody do a lot of polyphony? Uh, he did, but they were generally... Uh, Arrangements. Yes, that's not. Yes, he did. Right. And so it wasn't really until F. John's day, F. John cut back to the basic you know, things written on scripts. Right, he's where he was working on the manuscripts. And, and put those together as works originally for low voice. Right, yes. Right. But, and that's when it was coming back up. Isn't it an appropriate thing for this to be in the academy, not necessarily to measure success by whether it's done everywhere, but whether it survives here, whether it continues that process? I know personally, I came as a freshman and sang French song, you know, I've been singing since boys' choir, and I think we went back to front of and that was it. Um, and that started freshman year singing just then. And then uh, in the course here, Greg Smith put together a group of about 80 where you sang from a group part book without oh, any yes. You know, and so the first couple of rehearsals were total crash and burns. But again, it's how they sang. And it was an educational, you know, part of the academy. Mm -hmm. And you've both done the same thing. I think that by itself is a worry. The academy is a good word. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. I, I also think it's. Um, not, not exclusive to that, but I think also we have, because we are at Harvard, and I don't mean this from a sort of institutional narcissism, I think we have a responsibility to lead. I think we have, people look to Harvard for leadership in the sciences and in politics and in engineering, you know, and I think they look to leadership um, in, uh, in music and in choral music. And so I think, yes, we should sustain um, we should sustain the practice of learning um, polyphonic music so that it survives, and then at the same time do everything we can to advocate for it and to to share it in, in other settings and so that more and more high school students are coming where it doesn't feel like a foreign language where yes. it might now, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I just, I wanna thank everybody for coming, and Jim's gonna be st sticking around um, Books. If anybody wants to to uh, to get a book and to have a book signed, um, I want to just leave you actually with one quote that was my favorite moment in the book. It's actually from the preface. Oh, um, this is so beautiful. It is preface. Your preface. Oh, your preface. <laughs> so I just want to, want to finish up with this uh, this short excerpt. Um, I believe. This is Jim Marvin writing. <laughs> I believe choral music has the power to draw us into a spiritual realm, a transcendence that allows a fleeting moment of peace. In today's world, and in fact throughout time, we have sought feelings of transcendence. To be able to absorb and reflect upon humanity's greatest source of strength, the contemplation of an essence impossible to understand but made manifest, 
by the incomprehensible mystery of life gives us strength, enriches our souls, and it reconfirms humanity's greatest gift, the capacity to love. Mm. So I just want to thank you so much for your time and for writing this book. <laughs>